Um, this afternoon, we get to start off with um, Dr. Lori Friel, who is um, from the University of South Florida at Tampa in the Department of Criminology. Uh, Dr. Friel Rudell is considered to be one of the leading experts on bias policing, which is something that we have all began to talk about, the idea of how we could ever have truly bias-free policing prior to joining the university in 2005. She spent uh, six years as a director of research for the police um, executive research forum, or better known as PERF, in Washington, D.C. And for those of us, like myself, who have a background in law enforcement, that is considered to be absolutely the um, premier organization that police chiefs and sheriffs look to and, and trust to help them figure out what changes they need to make. Um, Dr. Friedel speaks um, nationally on the topic of um, bias-free policing and has provided consultation and training to agencies, uh, has published and written, and you have all of, a lot of the details uh, in your materials. Um, and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Margo, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, this whole conference is about bringing research to practice. You're focusing mostly on how bringing research can help you in your work on accountability and legitimacy. And what I've been asked to talk about is our example of research to practice, and that's taking the science of bias, the modern science of bias, and bringing it to police departments in the form of training. So this is what I want to talk about with you today. One, what I learned from the science, what I learned from the social psychologists that study bias and prejudice, what implicit bias looks like in law enforcement, the implications of that science for police practice, and then finally, some of the lessons that we learned in terms of trying to produce change based on scientific research. So the modern science of bias, you know, the social psychologists, they taught me two important things that transformed my thinking about bias generally and bias in policing in particular. One, they taught me the difference between explicit and implicit bias. And then they taught me that bias has changed over time. Now, I have a feeling I've got a pretty educated audience here. But just a briefer, a little brief on explicit versus implicit. Explicit bias is generally what someone thinks about when they picture a person with prejudice and bias. They picture someone who links various groups to stereotypes. Those groups might be based on race, gender, LGBT, whatever. Those stereotypes that are linked to those groups, that's based on animus and hostility towards those groups. Those stereotypes can impact on that person's perceptions and also on their behavior, producing discriminatory behavior. And the person with explicit bias knows it, owns it, and will even tell you about it. It's overt, it's on the table, it's deliberate. A racist would be an example. Implicit bias actually shares some characteristics with explicit bias. We still link various groups to stereotypes associated with the group, but it's not necessarily based on animus and hostility. Those stereotypes impact on our perceptions and our behavior, possibly producing discriminatory behavior. But some real key differences, this can happen outside of our conscious awareness. And the really bad news for everybody in the room this occurs even in people who, at the conscious level, reject bias, stereotype, and prejudice. So the first thing they taught me, the difference between explicit and implicit. The second thing, and it made a lot of sense, bias in our society has changed over time. In our grandparents' time, it was more likely to be explicit. In modern humans, even though everyone in this room knows we still have explicit bias, it's actually more likely to be implicit. Because up until my exposure to that science, I had come to believe two things very strongly that just didn't go together in my head. One, after thinking about this issue for a number of years and going across the country talking about it, I came to understand that bias in policing was more than just a few bad officers in a few departments. It was widespread. But I also came to believe very firmly that most of the cops in this country are well-intentioned individuals who want to serve their communities. And I couldn't put those two things together until the science bridged them. So 
These social psychologists <coughs> spent many years talking to each other in academic journals, and finally they said, the rest of us need to wake up. Hardin and Banaji said, personal and public policy discussions regarding prejudice and discrimination are too often based on an outdated notion of prejudice. And what they were saying is, we were ignoring implicit bias and focusing only on explicit bias. And this was definitely true in our discussion of bias policing in this country, between the police and the community. As I saw, many police and stakeholders have assumed that bias in policing is produced by officers with explicit bias, and only produced by officers with explicit bias. And I'm going to argue that that has negatively impacted our discussion in this country and has negatively impacted our interventions. I call it the destructive equation. I think this is the equation that has defined our conversation and our thinking. Police with explicit biases, such as racist, and only police with explicit bias produce bias in policing. And this has been detrimental for several reasons. One, it produces distortions that harms the relationship between the police and the diverse communities that it serves. Because if, in fact, it is true that there are community members who think that bias in policing is only produced by ill-intentioned police with explicit biases, and two, if there are diverse communities that think that bias policing is widespread, and we know that's true, if they put A and B together, they end up thinking there's a whole lot of ill-intentioned cops out there that have animus and hostility towards their groups. This is also, this characterization is also destructive because it leads police to minimize the problem and be very defensive about it. Because if police, too, think it's only officers with explicit bias that produce bias in policing, and they look into their own hearts and they look around themselves and they don't see all these ill-intentioned people with animus and hostility, what are they going to conclude? The problem really isn't that big and we're being unfairly castigated. And then finally, this characterization that it's only explicit bias that produces bias in policing leads to inappropriate interventions. So what do we know from the science of bias? Like I said, we categorize people. We link them to the stereotypes associated with their group. This happens automatically. It, happens, it impacts our perceptions and our behaviors. And it happens even in well-intentioned people. One of the implicit biases or associations that is very relevant to this whole discussion is the linkage that we have between African Americans and crime and violence. This has been well researched and so we have this implicit association, it impacts our perceptions, it impacts our behaviors, it happens automatically even in well-intentioned people. What else do we know? Well it's not just stereotypes about particular demographic groups. There's also what they call the we-they bias or for the more advanced in the room, outgroup bias. All of us have our we. For me, in many contexts or professional contexts, it's going to be white, middle-aged, educated female. And everybody else is my they. And you won't be surprised to know that we feel much more comfortable with our we than we do with our they. And the science shows we actually see more positive characteristics in people who are in our we than in our they. Now, the ultimate outgroup or they bias is dehumanization. Susan Fisk did a study. She's from Princeton. She brought her subjects into a laboratory setting and hooked them up to an MRI and then showed them pictures. And you know the MRI is going to be looking for some brain activity. Certain parts of the brain are going to light up. So she shows them pictures. And mostly she shows them pictures, headshots, of people that look like you and me. And when those headshots come up, there's a certain part of the brain that lights up. We'll call it the, oh, that's a human just like me, part of the brain. <laughs> she didn't discover it. Others did. It, it lights up when we look in the mirror, and it lights up when we see a human like me. But what Susan Fisk did is interspersed into those pictures of people that look like you and me, pictures of people who looked homeless, dirty, disheveled, unshaven, ratty clothing, and when those pictures came up, this part of the brain did not light up. The part of the brain that says, oh, that's a human just like me. Now, having just said that we have a we-they bias, we also know that we can have biases against our own groups. 
Poor people can have biases against poor people. Women can have biases against women. Blacks can have biases against blacks. My own example, I was getting some painting done in my house and I had people coming over to give me estimates and a husband-wife team came. She's holding the clipboard. She's asking me questions about the work I want done. She's answering my questions and ladies, you know exactly what was happening, right? I found myself looking right past her and talking to her husband. Men are the boss. Men are the painters. All right. So we also know some other things from the science of bias. We know that there are certain factors that exacerbate the possibility of bias. Ambiguity and time pressures. And I can't think of a profession more than police that faces ambiguity and time pressures. What else do we know? Well, here's the good news, actually. We know that implicit biases are malleable. They're not fixed. We can actually do things as individuals. We can reduce our biases and then we can manage our biases. So two concepts related to reducing our biases, contact theory and exposure to counter stereotypes. And these are both going to be intuitive to you. Contact theory says positive contact with people who are different from us can reduce our biases. Right? The more we have positive contact with Muslims, with transgender, with different races, with the undocumented, it can reduce our biases. Another one is also going to be make sense to you. We can reduce our biases by exposure to counter stereotypes. So if this is a group and this is the stereotype you have about them, if you start to come up against people in this group that are the opposite of the stereotype, they're a counter stereotype, you can understand that that'll weaken your stereotype, that exposure to the counter stereotypes. Now, we're never going to reduce our biases to zero, so it's a good thing we can manage them. We can manage them through three bullets. If we recognize our implicit biases and we're motivated, we can choose to implement bias-free behavior. We can choose to implement bias-free behavior. So now what does bias look like in law enforcement? Well, I'm preaching to the choir here, I know. But what does it look like? It might manifest in traffic stops, bicycle stops, removal from cars and searches. It might look like stop and frisk. In fact, some of you know that the New York Judge Shinlin wrote about unconscious bias in Floyd versus City of New York. Unconscious bias could help explain the otherwise puzzling fact that NYPD officers check furtive movements, ambiguity, furtive movement in 48% of the stops of the blacks, 45% of the stops of the Hispanics, but only 40% of the stops of the whites. There's no evidence that black people's movements are objectively more furtive than the movements of white people. What does bias look like in law enforcement? Race out of place stops, income out of place stops, right? Stop in the black in the white neighborhood, stop in the white in the black neighborhood, the beat up car in the nice neighborhood. And then of course, huge national discussion. What does bias look like? It can look like overvigilance in the use of force. Faulkner and Carter did an in-depth study in Philadelphia of their deadly force. And they looked at many things, including threat perception failure. And threat perception failure is a mistake of fact. The officers thought that the person they were dealing with was armed. Turns out they were not. Mistake of fact. And what did they find? Threat perception failure was much more likely if it was a black subject. And again, we're talking here about the possibility of implicit bias, just seeing more threat, seeing more threat in those furtive movements, seeing more threat went up against ambiguous behavior. And then this next study was just out. It was in the news in the last week or so. These researchers, Nick said all, looked at the Washington Post data set on deadly force and found that black individuals were shot and killed by police. The black individuals who were shot and killed by police were less likely to be armed than their white counterparts. What does bias look like in law enforcement? It looks like friendly fire. There was a New York State Task Force on police on police shootings. What did they find? Off-duty, plain-clothed officers who are killed by friendly fire are disproportionately individuals of color. And those report writers referenced implicit bias as a possible cause. What does bias look like in law enforcement? Abusive policing through dehumanization. Goff et al. Goff's now at John Jay. 
Dehumanization is viewed as a central component to intergroup violence because it is frequently the most important precursor to moral exclusion, the process by which stigmatized groups are placed outside the boundary in which moral values, rules, and considerations of fairness apply. Now, even though a lot of these examples, even though a lot of the research I cited has been looking at race and ethnicity, Folks in this group know we're not just talking about racial and ethnic minorities. We're talking about bias that's against LBTQ individuals, low income, juveniles, Muslims, undocumented, and so forth. So it's widespread. So what are the implications of the science for practice? This is a whole conference about research to practice. What are those implications? First, a couple things we should not do, so says the science. We should not rely solely on methods for explicit bias, and certainly not when we're dealing with people who have implicit bias. For many years, we've trained police as if they all have explicit bias. And it's going to look something like this. Stop being prejudiced. These are really nice people. <coughs> and any one of you sitting at the other end of that finger would be wholly offended to be sitting and hearing that. We cannot treat them as if they all have explicit biases. We also, it turns out, cannot try to suppress biases. Don't even try to tell me that you're colorblind, because I ain't going for it, all right? Don't try to suppress your biases, because in fact, there are unintended consequences. So what are some of the implications for practice? That contact theory, right? Now, we know that positive contact between police and community members has oh so many payoffs, but the science adds one more. When the police are out there having positive contact with transgendered and undocumented and homeless and racial ethnic groups that are not their own, that can have an impact to reduce their own biases. And then the really good news about the contact theory is that it's bi-directional. Because when the police are out there having positive contact with all those groups, presumably those folks are also having positive contact with the police to reduce the biases and stereotypes about police. What are the implications for practice? Use of force training. I'm returning here to that concept of counter stereotypes. And again, I got a knowledgeable group. I'm talking primarily about the video training that cops go through. This is their judgment training, right? And you know they're interacting <coughs> with a um, action that's playing out on the video. And they're going to face a person or persons. And those people are either going to turn out to be a threat or not turn out to be a threat. And the officer has to make that judgment. And if they're a threat, do I need force and how much? How do we take demographics? How do we take biases out of that training? The person who turns out to be a threat is just as likely to be a female as a male, just as likely to be Caucasian as a racial ethnic minority, just as likely to be middle-aged as a young person, and if we put the officers through this and condition them, and there's actually some research, laboratory research albeit, that supports that can make the officers focus on other than demographics, focus on other clues for threat. And that's what we want. Other type of training, other type of training. So that's important for the use of force, split second decisions. Other training, what the scientists tell us is the first step is understanding our implicit biases. And then once we understand our implicit biases, and if we're motivated, we can reduce and manage them. And so that's what we're doing with the fair and impartial policing curricula. And we have five different versions, and they were, the development of it and the dissemination of it has been funded by the US DOJ COPS office. A version for recruits and in-service officers, first-line supervisors, mid-managers, command, or the best is when I have command and community stakeholders in the room. And then finally, an instructor's course. I've got an FAP trained officer in the room. Where is she? Yay! Glad to have you here. So what is the content of the curriculum? Well, this is the curriculum for either the recruit or the patrol officer. We want them to understand that even good people have biases, and that includes him and her. We want them to understand that biases and stereotypes can impact on our perceptions, and unless we thwart it, impact on our behavior. Our mantra is this, policing based on biases and stereotypes, ineffective, unsafe, unjust. And then finally, we want them to have tools to help them manage 
and reduce their biases, particularly in the context of their police work. What do we need to do for first-line supervisors? Explain how bias can manifest in even well-intentioned people. How to identify bias that might be manifesting in their supervisees. What should they do when they find it? We also talk to them about how bias might manifest in their own decisions. And then finally, how to talk about bias with individuals, with groups. Now for command staff, after they hear about the science of bias, we're talking about the higher level functions in the agency. And what are the implications of the science for, for instance, recruitment and hiring, policy, training, leadership supervision and accountability, operations, measurement, and outreach to diverse communities? What are some of the other implications of the science for practice? Recognize and reduce the great risks of bias in high discretionary police practices linked to crime control. Let me parse out that mouthful, all right? And this is going to be so intuitive to the group I have in this room. When do biases manifest? In high discretionary activities, right? When do we have most problem of maybe linking people to crime biases? When those high discretionary activities are linked to crime control. We tell the officer, go out there and do stop and frisk because you're going to reduce guns on the street. So where do we have these great risks of bias? Request for consent to search. Stop and frisk. The chief that says to his folks, go out there and use your traffic stop powers to find the crooks, find the guns, field interrogations, and so forth. High discretionary activities that are linked in the officer's mind to crime control are ripe for biases. So now, what are some of the lessons that we have learned from our bringing science of bias to police departments that might be relevant to your important work? Use solid science. Use solid science. The most common positive response we get on the evaluations from officers is it was science-based. They very much appreciate it. Because think about this. I've got about 12 trainers, most of them sworn. They're walking into a room. Picture them walking into a room of 30 sergeants that have 10 or 15 years on. What do you think that reception looks like? <laughs> Our groups are generally somewhere between defensive and outright hostile. OK. But then we start talking to them about science. And we're giving them studies and methods and results. And we're not talking about the science of police bias. We're talking about the science of human bias and how it can make them less effective, less safe, and unjust. So by the time we leave, rave reviews. This North Carolina sergeant, about two weeks before we came to town, had been through traditional racial profiling training. Stop being prejudiced. These are really nice people. All right. And then he's told, you've been handpicked to be an instructor for fair and impartial policing. So not only are you going to sit through two and a half days of training, but then you're going to go train the rest of the agency. Here's what he wrote in his evaluation. I wanted nothing to do with fair and impartial policing or its philosophy. As fate would have it, I was handpicked to attend the train the officer class and forced to go after presenting every excuse I could come up with. <laughs> I came in Monday as opposed and as defensive as I could covertly be without getting into trouble. As we say in the South, bless his heart for that. All right. <laughs> it took about two hours, and I was sold on the theory of the class and wondering why I had not been through it sooner. And that's the science. That's bringing solid science to these officers. Now, there are consequences for bringing in bad science. Some of you know I have very strong feelings about how we analyze vehicle and pedestrian stop data. Got a very thick book that I wrote on it. And so if you collect information from the agency on vehicle stops, pedestrian stops, stop and frisk, and you benchmark it against census data, and then you tell the world that that disparity means it's all police bias, don't be surprised when you go to partner with the police for change that they're going to turn their backs on you. Because in the words of Tom Tyler, you've lost your legitimacy. You bring in bad science, you've lost your legitimacy. How do you produce change? You tell the truth. For us, telling the truth 
is this hard fact. People of color are disproportionately represented among the people who commit street crime. I'm a criminologist. We've studied this. It's not a racial cause. It's an income cause, right? Lower income people disproportionately involved in street crime. We could spend two weeks talking about it, but it is the case. People of color are disproportionately represented in the low income levels. And that helps us understand what criminologists have shown. People of color are disproportionately involved in the people who commit street crime. Now, a couple of things. A big but follows that in our training, all right? And the big but is even if some stereotypes, quote unquote, are based in part on fact, that does not allow you to treat the individual as if they fit the stereotype. That's where we go wrong. We err when we treat the individual as if they fit the stereotype. But telling the truth is important. In fact, there's a lot of tension in the class until this comes out, because they're thinking, this is a bunch of liberals coming in, asking us why we have these stereotypes. We even had an activist group looking at our curriculum, getting ready to recommend it you know, to a, uh, a judge in a particular monitored area. And they said, we love the curriculum, but slide 34, got to go. Our response, no. Because if you're going to have change, you need to tell the truth. You need to tell the truth. How do you produce change? You report what's in it for them. What's in it for them? Again, our mantra, policing based on stereotypes and biases, ineffective, unsafe, and unjust. And I will tell you, unsafe perks them up, right? We do back-to-back -back role plays with the recruits. Woman with a gun, followed by man with a gun. So it's two sets of recruits that are going to respond to woman with a gun, man with a gun. Basically, we're describing a woman on the corner, brandishing an unlawful firearm. They're exactly the same scenario with a woman and a man, and we get huge differences in how they respond, right? Overwhelmingly, they find the gun in the small of the man's back. Overwhelmingly, they don't find it in the small of the woman because they have not detained her. They have not conducted the frisk. Well, stereotypes are based in part on fact. Women are less likely going to have a gun. They are less violent. But if you treat the individual as if she fits the stereotype, you're not going to find the gun. And then the other story catches their attention. Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department lost two officers in 2014 who were assassinated while eating pizza for lunch. And we were in Las Vegas about six weeks after that. And we got to policing based on stereotypes is unsafe, and one of the officers stopped the class and told his story. Because he was one of the responding officers. And at that point, they knew that two of their colleagues had just been slain while eating lunch. They did not know by whom. They did not know where to go. But then there was a shooting of a civilian in the Walmart nearby, so that's where this guy was deployed, our officer. And he's in that store. And he sees, actually, a white male who doesn't see him, who's armed, and so he's headed in that direction. And then he sees this white female dressed in casual clothes off to the side. And as he tells it, he's ready to dismiss her. Because he's had this picture in his head. As he's going through this scenario, he had one picture in his head when we had cop killers, another picture in his head when he had active shooters, and it was never a white woman. He finally figured out she's exactly where she wants to be. They both drew their weapons. He got his shot off and injured her. But what was his point? Policing based on stereotypes can be unsafe. Tell them what's in it for them. So lessons learned. Use solid science. Tell the truth, report what's in it for them. So this conference is about evidence-based policing. And traditionally, we've thought about evidence-based policing in terms of you know, how can we make crime control and traffic control better. For us, for my team, it's how can we use science to promote bias-free policing. For you, how do you use science to promote accountability and legitimacy? And why do we do that? Why do we get up? every morning with the commitment that we have. Who do we do this for? We do it for Nikki in Missouri. And Nikki contacted me. We had done a training in the St. Louis area, St. Louis, Ferguson, all that area, and it had been on TV. And She heard about our training. and She writes me an email. And I'll tell you, her note was riddled with misspellings and grammatical errors, made me think that it might be you know, low income, poor education. She described her most recent interaction with police. Wasn't her first. Probably won't be her last. And what she described was very ugly. 
And then she ended it with this. So thanks for trying to help them with their biased ways. I cried when I got it. I have it printed out. It's taped on my wall. You guys are doing the good work to make policing better. And why are we doing that? For all the Nickies in Missouri. So keep up the good work. I appreciate what all you do.